For the life of me, I do not know if the majority of you are aware of the raft of crap I receive in the comments from a small subset of the audience that goes something like this. Why do you always feature those things from Germany that cost like 200 grand? Why can't you feature something that's affordable? But invariably, I never see those same commenters watching my many Korean baby buggy episodes. So today, we're gonna do something a bit different. Yes, German, but this one, it might grab people's attention in a bit of a different way. So yes, this is an entirely new Volkswagen GTI. But no, Volkswagen will no longer be offering a Golf without the GTI bits this side of the Atlantic. And yes, it does have the very same EA 888 2-liter four-cylinder gasoline turbocharged direct-injected engine. However, here, a couple of changes. Uh, 242 horsepower, 273 pound-feet of torque. Something that really hasn't changed is how they offer it in this country. It's either a six-speed manual or a dual-clutch, the Volkswagen DSG, which really is a magnificent transmission. Outside of that, I do not have any other specific testing data for you. Uh, the only thing I have is 0 to 60, 6.3 seconds to 60. VMAX, uh, fuel economy, all that stuff is going to have to come at a later date when we get a U.S. market car. Something lightweight today, 3,046 pounds, or depending on how you express your weights and measures, 1,382 kilograms. With that, let's get back into one of our favorites in the cheap and cheerful department. Oh yes, that feels very much like the GTIs that have come before it. Although, what did they say the zero to 60 of this thing was? Granted, I do not have any instruments on this vehicle, especially this being a German market car, but I would be shocked to believe that this is 6.3 to 60. I'd say it's, if it's a second faster, that's more believable because this thing is a downright quick car. Yeah, of course, I would much prefer the manual transmission, but this is one of two, maybe three automatics that I am not mad at. And it works incredibly well, not only with this package, but with this specific engine. It's wonderful in terms of changing gears. You do get that mechanical shift feel that we get in like that BMW DSG, not quite as pronounced as that. But here, the thing I like about this so much is you just don't get denied shifts. Like you control this thing in a wonderful manual way. And that can't be said for every transmission that even is a dual clutch. And then there's just the feeling of way this thing delivers power. And the only way to describe that, are you guys talking Heads fans? Uh, if you are, you would know the song very well. Uh, Naive Melody, or This Must Be The Place. The minute I got into this thing and rolled off the airport grounds, I couldn't help but having that song run through my head because it feels like the place we have been before. It feels like GTIs that have come before it. It's just maybe a wee bit sharper. It's a wee bit more fun, but nothing, nothing radical and change. And in today's day and age, combined with what this vehicle is trying to be, incremental change is a much more prudent choice here. It enables the vehicle to build on the fun that was and make it adapted for today. Now, are you gonna sit there and honestly try to tell me that that thing doesn't look like a GTI? I thought so. Yet here is why that's the case. You see, the GTI is on a secondary list of cars, kind of like the Mini, the Range Rover, the 911, where if the designers changed them too much, there would be a mob of people from all over the world that would have them publicly drawn and quartered. And here there's also the whole aspect of it being a practical vehicle, so the sizing has to work as well. So overall, it's still a handsome car. However, the front and the back, that's where I'm struggling a bit. The back, I can honestly tell you, I don't like it. And it's not just because I'm Greek, it's because it's too bland. The proportion in the rear doesn't work with the proportion in the front. They've added some shape to the front, Granted, the shape, it drops off a bit too quickly for my taste, 
but they don't match front and rear. I'd like to see a bit more organic shape, even with a box on wheels. I think we'd all agree this has never been about straight line performance. This has always been about driving dynamics in a more economical package. Uh, and here, the package really hasn't changed. Underneath, it's still very much an MQB platform, meaning that really hasn't changed, which also means McPherson struts in the front and multi-link in the rear, which does an incredible job of controlling pitch, squat, dive, and roll. Now, there are some changes, uh, like for example, the subframe up front, they make it out of more exotic materials if you consider aluminum exotic. And then a limited slip differential does make its way to the front wheel drive GTI. And here it does a great job managing a front wheel drive vehicle. Does it do a great job hiding the fact that it's a front wheel drive vehicle? No, I would argue that's one of the charms of this thing. It works incredibly well around town and probably in bad weather. But the reality is, look what we can do out here on these roads. I don't feel like the wheels are fighting to do two different things at once. Now this car is fitted with an option we've seen on Volkswagens in the past, the adjustable dampers, the DCC. Uh, but here its interaction is rather unusual. There isn't like a soft, medium, and hard setting. There are different points at which you can change the control. Like you can have somewhere kind of stiff and somewhere kind of comfort. I think there are like 12 to 15 points in the settings. It's through this oddball UX system. Yeah, it kind of works, but I can't honestly tell you there's a huge difference in one super stiff setting. Oh God, this car is so fun. And another stiff setting. Then pressing onto the steering, this was always one of the hallmarks, especially of later GTIs. Unusually good feedback. It's direct, but the weighting, something really hard to do with a front wheel drive vehicle, this works incredibly well. Because usually what happens is the front wheels are fighting with the steering. I'm like, no, we want to pull the car forward. No, we want to steer. Here, there is a good balance. Perhaps they should go into the business of Middle East peace. Yes, it is indeed that time again to play your favorite game, Mind the Options Game, with today's contestant, something that doesn't have any U.S. pricing. Uh, you see, I've mentioned in this episode that this is a German market car, but unlike all of those German market Porsches and Mercedes we get, uh, I don't have anything to give you here other than the European pricing, which I do have, so let's dive right into it. The 2022 Mark 8 Volkswagen Golf GTI, which I believe that is the correct name in the European market in the US, it will just be called a GTI for 38,580 euro. That is for a DSG, which this car is. Uh, then we press onto the color. Uh, they don't charge extra for King's Red, which I have to say looks really good. It's kind of like a lighter burgundy. I do love the interior. We'll discuss more of that later. We press on to the 19 inch wheels. They call this the Adelaide option. So I guess they love Australia for some reason. 1,480 euros. Then the dynamic chassis control. So that's the adjustable suspension system. That is an important option on this car. I would say well worth 1,045 euros. Uh, then the comfort package. This makes the car a bit more fancy. And this is one of the things that would probably be on offer just in the European market and not in the US market because they're trying to hit more of a price in the US. So this at 1,620 euro probably wouldn't even be an option in the US. Then the LED headlights, I believe this is the always on high beams, 1,125 euros. Again, not an offer in the US, not because of Volkswagen, rather because of the US government. And the navigation system. That is an additional 710 euro. Then the winter package, 450 euro. That is something very important because one gets heated seats and a heated steering wheel. Then we press on to one of my most favorite options, which could also be considered me letting a bit too much pilot av geek nerd fall out of my pocket, the head up display. And here, I hate to make this admission. I do not think it's going to make the transatlantic journey. You see in the GTI world in Europe, people, they're willing to pay a bit more for these vehicles than the US market, and this is one of the casualties, at least that I see. However, may I make a suggestion? Yes, you charge 700 euro in the European market. I think some people in the US would be willing to pay for that, but that could be just me. Then we press on to the rear view camera. This will not be optional in the US market, 
because Washington says so. That is, uh, any U.S. car, I don't care if it's a cheap-ass Versa Note or if it's something fun to drive like this, so we wouldn't have to pay the extra 325 euro. Then we press on to the sound system. Volkswagen, they do something different on each side of the Atlantic. You and I have seen them do this whole Fender thing for the U.S. cars. So my guess is, in the U.S., they're going to brand it Fender. Either way, it's still made by the same company. This one has a Harman Kardon by Harman sound system. It's 680 euro. I wouldn't be surprised if it's the same bits underneath. Then we press on to the fog and cornering light system. This is something I would love to see make the transatlantic journey. And no, not because I'm some sort of light fetish. Rather, I love the integration of the fog lights into the front fascia. It's not only unique, it changes the detailing of the front of the car and makes it not Boring. So I would say well worth the 365 euro. Then we press on to the only item on this car's German build sheet that presented a challenge. You see, if I were to directly translate this, it would be smart key for phone, which would tell me the smart key is fitted as standard. Put it in your pocket, go up, open the door, get in the car started, it goes. However, if one wants to provision their phone as a smart key or provision a friend's phone as a smart key without having to hand over a real key, that is an option, one I do hope makes it to the US, and in Europe it is 230 euro. And we press on to an option that will absolutely not make it to the US because it varies by state law, and that would be tinted rear windows for 270 euro, which brings us to the total retail price of a GTI of 48,075 euro. Put another way, 58,045 dollars. Now, before you have a heart attack, when was the last time you saw a new GTI at a U.S. Volkswagen dealership with a base price of almost 60,000 U.S.? That's what I thought. So if I'm taking a stab in the dark, or I'm reading the tea leaves, I'm guessing the base price would be about half that. 30, maybe 32 grand, and here's my logic. The previous car was a bit lower than that. And then there's still going to be a Golf R in the U.S., which base price was, what, 37, 38, 39, something like that. So you're somewhere in between that, and you still have to leave some room for some of these options we talked about. So I'm sticking with 30 to 32. So let's you and I continue our throwback musical theme on the inside. And here it's not so much this must be the place, rather it's Radio Clash. Now, I'm not mad at the design, which clearly has been pilfered from the ID line. My problem is with the UX design. Uh, I just don't love the system they had in the ID. I get what they were going for with the concept of the different applications and making it all screens. That I'm really not mad at. I'm mad at this is the volume. Like, I got to look over here. Even though I can do this to raise and lower the volume, I still have to look over here. It's even more confusing on the steering wheel because that's also capacitive touch. Let's go back to the basic concepts of knobs and toggle switches. Like, there is one in this car. To adjust the mirrors, it is a knob. It's got a rotary switch where you go right, left, and then you can adjust the mirrors. That is the easiest thing to control in this vehicle. And then everything else in terms of how much time it takes you to change the radio, how much time it takes you to do all this stuff, it just, it, it's not intuitive. Yes, there's voice control here, but you and I both know that's not always the thing that works. Let's you and I put the UX aside and focus on the very German and very GTI bits. First and foremost, something you have been staring at throughout this entire episode, the seats. Man, not only do they work incredibly well, they are stunning to look at. I don't know what the technical term of that pattern is. I've been told it's verbery. Got to be honest, whether it's made up or not, I kind of like the term verbery, so let's just go with that. Either way, I would absolutely do the Verberry inside of this vehicle. I don't care how nice the leather could be because it just stands out. I wish more cars would offer this. Like, I would do this kind of interior inside of a Porsche. I would do this inside of, like, a Mercedes convertible. And then there's the seats themselves. They work incredibly well with this vehicle. I'm kind of surprised how supportive they are, which brings us to a very important point about this particular car we are driving, which I believe is serial ending 44. Yes, I've already told you this is a German market car. And as such, it's built 
more like people buy cars in Europe by the ounce, not by the pound. And that's why it costs so much in the options game. And as such, it's fitted like a German market car. It's got uh, HVAC controls in the rear in a GTI. The map pockets are carpeted. That doesn't happen in the US anymore. My guess is the ones in the US won't come the same way. However, I would like the seats to come the same way. With that, let's head back to the hangar and rock the Casbah. So 80s music references aside, you will not be surprised to learn that this is indeed very good. It is exactly what you expect it to be. And most importantly, it is sharper than the car it replaces. Now that we understand that, we need to spend more time focusing on the wish list. And not that we need to change anything, rather we gotta focus on the transition from this German market car to the US market car. And here, this is something we've seen Volkswagen do over the past many years. And the question is, is it their fault or is it the market fault? They've had to lower the price point of their cars in the US to become more competitive. People weren't really willing to pay more money for a better built car that had a Volkswagen badge. They needed an Audi badge or a Mercedes badge. So they made things like the Passat, and that was like a $20,000 car, or the Atlas, that was a $30,000 crossover, where the same vehicles in Europe, they're way more expensive, but they also have better build quality. This car is one of those examples. Like we looked at some of the door panels. This one is screwed together better because someone's paying almost 60 grand for this car. But in the US, I'm guessing about 30 grand. So the only thing I'm asking for is I understand probably not gonna have the rear HVAC controls, probably not gonna have some of the fancy bits like the comfort package. But how about we keep some of the details like the carpeting in the map pockets or the better tactile feel throughout the entire interior. This way it would be more than just, oh my God, that's one of the best performance bargains on the market, bar none, in the US, to it's a performance bargain. And you know what? It's a nice place to be on the inside. And this is the point of the episode where it turns around to you guys to opine in the comments below or via our social media, Moto Man TV on Word, Moto Man TV on Word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And with that, it is time for me to bid you adieu because Kumo and I need to determine how we are going to pilfer the upholstery from there for a project von Sufenhausen we are working on over there. Until we see you in the next episode, bish, bye bye.